and I welcome you again now formally to our lecture series Innovation Pathways to Sustainability, which is uh, usually uh, an event of the transdisciplinary research area Innovation and Technology for Sustainable Futures. And you now have heard innovation twice. So today we actually innovate by making this a joint event uh, with the Center for Development Research and its uh, colloquium series. And because uh, both had uh, asked Ingmar Weber for a lecture and we thought we might um, basically merge the two events uh, in one. Um, so we have a joint lecture today with Professor Ingmar Weber, who I'd like to briefly introduce to you today. Um, you see the topic of the lecture already on the screen. Um, Ingmar Weber is the research director for social computing at the Qatar Computing Research Institute, QCRI. And his interdisciplinary research looks at what uh, user-generated, online user-generated data can tell us about the world, both the offline and the online world and society at large. Uh, he does work with sociologists, political scientists, demographers and medical scientists, but also with UN agencies and NGOs in using data science for development and other issues. And prior to joining the QCRI, Dr. Weber was a researcher at Yahoo Research Barcelona. He studied mathematics at the University of Cambridge and then pursued a PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Computer Science. And he's also a senior member of various uh, um, professional organizations, the ACM, the IEEE, and the AAAI. Um, I assume you all know those associations. Um, and he also serves uh, as a distinguished speaker of the ACM, that's the Association for Com Computing Machinery. But um, uh, I'll basically stop here and uh, pass over to our distinguished speaker. Ingmar, thank you very much for making time. And we're looking very much forward to hearing your talk. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Thanks for the opportunity to present um, my work. So um, yeah, so as mentioned, I will talk about digital data for uh, migration uh, research. And the work that I'll talk about is a um, it's joint work with a number of amazing uh, people. I just pick out two names from this long list. So there's a Kieran Barimella, who's currently um, at the MIT in uh, Cambridge in the US, and Emilio Zacchini from the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research in uh, Rostock. So I've worked both with Emilio and uh, um, Kieran for many, many years on these topics and uh, other um, uh, things. So um, yeah, so I will talk about um, how we can use non-traditional data uh, for complementing and improving existing migration statistics. And so you might ask, well, why is that an endeavor worth um, pursuing? So it's not just about numbers. I mean, I love numbers, but it's not just about having better numbers for the sake of uh, having better numbers. But hopefully, if we have better migration statistics, it leads actually to better uh, outcomes. And so here I'm just showing the title of a, um, a report that uh, was a joint report between IOM and uh, McKinsey uh, uh, that was done uh, two years ago, or three years ago, 2018. Um, where they look at a number of use cases where having better migration data might actually lead to better um, uh, outcomes. Right? Basically, so the, this work sort of founded, let's say, on the hope that better data leads to better outcomes. I'm happy to discuss this more, um, you know, also at the end and also, you know, uh, given the different uh, use cases that you see throughout the talk. So now given, okay, so that sounds like worth uh, pursuing, but so then what's the problem with uh, current uh, migration data? Well, even simple questions turn out to be not to have so simple answers, right? So for example, if you wanted to know how many people moved from Italy to Spain in 2015, right? So that should be you know, easy enough to know. But if you look at official data from Italy, you know, the answer is uh, just over 5,000. Then for the same question, official data from Spain, the answer is 17,000, right? So, I mean, they can't both be you know, sort of true. So, you know, even, even in this context, you know, migration data is really messy. And just to give one more example, so um, the UK uh, about sort of two years ago, uh, they had to admit that their sort of, you know, official data or gold uh, standard data was not so golden after all. Um, and so they had to be, uh, you know, downgraded to a status of experimental. And basically they had to admit um, that they were probably undercounting uh, migration from Eastern Europe um, uh, to the uh, UK, right? And so, these are just some examples to show that, you know, even if you just look at migration among rich countries, right, sort of migration data is often quite, quite bad, to be honest. Sort of. And of course, it's much worse if you look at a humanitarian crisis or at um, uh, a sort of a poorer countries around the world. So in the rest of, uh, here's a quick outline of the rest of my talk. So I'll first talk about uh, sort of new things that are 
possible with new data, sort of just sort of new concepts that might not even be possible to measure at all with traditional data sources. And I'll talk about how we can use non-traditional data for sort of knowing the present, right? which is mostly what this is called now casting. Very, very quickly, just some ongoing work on sort of predicting uh, the future, sort of or so. Uh, and I'll talk and I'll finish by talking about the importance of goats. And this will make sense uh, what that um, is about at the, uh, at the end. Okay, so let's look at uh, the sort of things that new data enable that might be difficult to do with uh, traditional um, uh, data. And so here I'll uh, start with uh, data that was collected from uh, Google Plus. Okay, so what is that we wanted to do here? So here we wanted to go beyond sort of origin destination uh, analysis, right? So if you look at uh, my own, right? So I'm a German citizen living in Qatar. So the question is, did I migrate from Germany to Qatar? Well, uh, kind of, yes. I mean, if you look at, you know, the data that the Qataris have about me, right? Just a German citizen living here, right? So origin, Germany, destination, Qatar, end of story. But actually my trajectory is a bit more complicated, right? So I moved to Germany, to the UK, back to Germany, to Switzerland. Then I actually moved uh, to um, Qatar directly from, um, uh, from Spain. But all of this is, uh, is lost, right? And so we, we look at this using um, uh, data from uh, Google Plus. Um, I mean, this was done many, many years ago when Google Plus was still <laughs> in existence, where um, uh, on a Google Plus uh, profile, right? so Google Plus was a social network that Google tried to sort of put to, you know, to the world and to rival Facebook. Um, you had, uh, you could list several places that you used to live at, right? So in this case, this is one of the collaborators, you used to live in all of these different uh, places, right? And so we would sort of collect um, this information for public um, uh, profiles. Um, um, and at that point, I did not yet have this label of currently that was added labor later. We only had a set of places, right? So we had a set of places that this person um, uh, uh, had lived in at the past, right? So we are going to data for uh, just over 22 million um, uh, users. So we knew sort of, uh, yes, just the set of countries that they had um, uh, lived in. So why is that interesting? So what is what is different about this from just sort of, you know, uh, origin destination? So let's look at some examples. So here, the first row is supposed to be a data for um, a particular migrant, for them to migrant one. Right? And this particular person has lived in three countries. So, so they have lived in countries A and B. I mean, they have lived in three countries, but this sort of generates bilateral flows between A and B, from A and C, and sort of uh, and from between B and um, uh, C. So, Right, so, so all these sort of pairs uh, are sort of derived from the set of countries that this person has lived in um, uh, sort of uh, together. And similarly for the others, it's simpler. There's only a single pair of uh, countries, right? And so if you combine all of these things, so these four migrants give uh, rise to like a single sort of co-occurrence count um, for, for these sort of six different pairs of uh, countries. Now here's a different set of um, uh, migrants with a different um, sort of pattern, right? So here's a migrant has actually lived in countries B, C, and D. It's different from the first set, but you know this actually gives a rise to the same aggregate uh, information on sort of bilateral uh, flows. I right? know the the point being here that um, in terms of bilateral flows, these two scenarios are identical, but they do actually differ in terms of this higher order um, uh, sort of um, migration clusters, as we call them, in terms of sort of so these uh, these triples, right? So we're interested in these sort of these triples and how they differ from what you might expect uh, just looking at the uh, um, pairs. And so, yes, yeah, so, so what is our expectation of what would be expected for these triples? So let's try to formalize this um, um, a bit, right? So if you have a lot of users who have lived in countries A and B and A and C and A and B and C, then we would expect also a large user count for A, B and C as a, sort of, as a triple, right? And so conversely, if we don't observe a lot of people who living in A and B, and A and C and B and C, and sort of, so then we would also expect like that the triple overall um, is not very um, uh, likely, right? Sort of. So, and if that's the case, then it's just basically the triple just reflects what's going on uh, on the individual sort of uh, pairs, right? And so, so if we we um, try different formalizations. This is the one that sort of worked best, where basically we would expect that the count for the triple is somewhat proportional to the product of the minimum uh, counts of the pairs and the average count of the um, um, uh, of the pairs. And and this turns out to you know capture quite a lot of variance in terms of the ranks. Um, uh, you know, what's more or less um, um, uh, frequent. So this gives us sort of, so, you know, we would expect triples to behave like this, given only what we know about the, uh, the pairs. And now let's look at when that, where there's a deviation from this expectation. Okay, so here I'm showing the, the features that are most predictive of the deviation. And so here you see a lot of things related to distance. So what is this about? So, so that basically um, means that if all three countries are close to each other, then you would then there's more than expected migration between all three of them, 
even if they, you already know how much is on each sort of pair, there is still like a bonus somehow that comes just from the fact that they are all um, close to each um, uh, um, uh, each other sort of. So this is basically the, the most important thing um, to take away from here. And just to give you sort of some um, uh, uh, examples, so the first triplet sort of shows this. So for example, if you knew only the, the, the pairwise um, sort of uh, close between Spain and France and Spain and Italy and France and Italy, there is still more than expected for the triple. And similarly, if, if you know everything about from UAE, uh, between UAE and India and UAE and Singapore and India and Singapore, there is still more than expected sort of migration movement between all three of them. Sort of, so. but then there are also cases where the opposite sort of holds, right? So there are quite a lot of people moving from Brazil to mix USA or at least between those two countries. We don't know the directionality in this data set and between Brazil and Mexico and between Mexico and USA. But there are very few that have lived in all three of them. Sort of so, so this is the sort of thing that you can pick up with this type of data that you could not do uh, through um, a traditional uh, type of data. And similarly here for sort of Canada, China, and uh, UK. So this was just one example of the kind of phenomena you can sort of study through new data that you might not um, be able to study with sort of traditional uh, migration data that only looks at uh, origin and um, uh, destination. So let's look at another example or sort of something new that you can do. In this case, um, uh, we look at uh, uh, Twitter um, uh, uh, data. And here it's about changes in um, uh, definition, right? Sort of so, so basically, if you ask yourself the questions, what was your main resident for the past, let's say, six months, right? And so here, this is the, this, the six in this case corresponds to this, to the, to this D. So, so, so um, every Every color box uh, corresponds to like one observation. So in this case, uh, the user was observed in the blue country, was again in the blue country, and then in the red country, a red country, and then blue country. So if I if I average across this sort of uh, three um, three countries, so this sort of a time window like this, you know, the modal country, the, the dominant country is red. So sort of I would say, okay, so probably the country of residence across this time window was the red country, right? And sort of, but now if you change the definition, I have a longer definition, then this changes. Sort of. So now, averaged over across a longer time period, suddenly the, um, the sort of the, the, the country of residence, you know, sort of also for the migrant is likely to be a different sort of country. And you can sort of see how change in definition um, affect your statistics, right? So, so, so this is so on the left, it's, it's for the so called duration, sort of also, right? And for the right, it's a different concept that we play with. So, so here, the, the question sort of to ask is where were you? One year ago, two years ago, three years ago, right? So, 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 so again, sort of, so, 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 so here, this is now sort of this time gap between sort of this T and um, uh, sort of uh, sort of T plus, right? Sort of, so, depending on how wide you you choose um, this time gap to be, again, you you get different different results about uh, who classifies as a migrant, right? And so here, you were just sort of interested in how these different definitions sort of interplay and what different uh, statistics you might um, uh, get. So for this, we collect the data from. Um, Twitter, so these were geotagged uh, tweets. So here's one example. I mean, this is not a tweet from our data set, but just this is just a geotagged tweet where somebody tweeted uh, from Bonn uh, a couple of days ago, uh, hoping that they would get, um, uh, uh, you know, COVID vaccination for their birthday, which is coming up uh, day after tomorrow on Saturday. Um, and so, um, yeah, so so we, we, we collected data for just over 60,000 Twitter users. Uh, in total, uh, about 15 million geotagged um, uh, tweets. And this was done in the US context, where for, just for this analysis, by migration, we mean migration between US census uh, divisions, sort of. So, so here, you know, each of these here, sort of nine little sort of things, is sort of, uh, you know, one, um, uh, um, one division. And we sort of see how, uh, you know, the migration rates change uh, in results to sort of changing the um, uh, uh, definitions. And then you could sort of see this sort of uh, observation. Right? Like as, you as you increase the, um, a duration that you average over your migration rates a drop. So if I start, this is obviously expected, right? Like if, if I average over my whole lifetime, there can only be one country that I've sort of lived in, um, you know, sort of so the um, um, uh, the most. Um, and uh, sort of uh, uh, conversely, sort of so uh, in terms of interval, if you ask me where did I live, you know, last week, I'm less likely to have moved. But where, if you ask me where, where did I leave, uh, live, you know, like a year ago, I'm more likely to have moved. Um, a sort of sense. But again, this sort of analysis on how your definitions affect your results, you cannot do with aggregate um, uh, migration data. Right? So, so again, this is something that you can only do through the sort of micro level uh, longitudinal data that you might find uh, on social media or maybe in other um, uh, data sources. Okay, so these were two examples more of sort of, so let's say, new questions or new methodological uh, approaches uh, you can sort of um, take with this data. But now let's look at something more operational where we now see, okay, so now how can we use such data for sort of knowing 
um, uh, the present. And so here, let's start with work we uh, did while I was at um, uh, Yahoo. So I left Yahoo about uh, nine years um, um, uh, ago. So here we were motivated by the question of asking how many people actually emigrate from the US in a given year. Right, sort of so. And so again, why is this interest? Why is this not known? Well, it turns out that um, there's a lot of known about immigration to the U.S., but the U.S. does not actually keep track of immigration from the U.S. I mean, there's some data in tax reforms, or sort of, so, so, but not, not nothing sort of um, sort of uh, exhaustive. Anyway, so, okay, can we fill some data gaps on what's known about immigration from the um, U.S.? Here, uh, we, we used uh, um, uh, data about IP addresses of users. Uh, connecting to um, to Yahoo, right? So here on the left, I'm showing you my my current uh, IP address, and this you can run through a number of sort of services. It's quite easy to locate that this IP address comes from um, uh, Doha, sort of. So and it's actually somewhat accurate. It's uh, you know sort of 10 kilometers. If you look at the precise coordinates, it's 10 kilometers away from my current uh, location. Even though the service says it's only accurate to like a thousand kilometers, it's actually pretty. Um, pretty accurate. In this case, you know, we uh, th this was done through MaxMind, but there are many other similar sort of um, uh, services, right? And so um, here, just one observation: anything at all that um, you frequently use would know your migration pattern, right? So for example, if you use a weather app and that you know every day pings, you know, for the latest weather, then that weather app will know your um, mobility patterns, right? And so, so in this case, we didn't use a weather app, but we use data from. Uh, a large email uh, provider, in this case, um, uh, uh, Yahoo um, um, uh, email. So this was collected for um, about uh, 43 million uh, Yahoo users between 2019 and 2011. All this data was anonymized. There were no email identifiers, uh, just you know, random number or like basically a sort of a hash um, uh, together with a birth year and uh, um, uh, gender information at the country level. So no precise geolocation was used for this um, uh, analysis. Um, uh, to sort of define migration, we just use a very, very simple definition. We just look at the modal country. So which country were you found in the most between these sort of two different sort of um, uh, time periods? So basically sort of, so let's say uh, uh, late uh, 2019 and uh, early uh, 2010, and then uh, uh, sort of similarly in uh, 2010 and 2011. Um, we um, also obtained internet penetration data at the sort of um, for country age and gender, and you you see how that why that matters in a second because we not use it sort of to correct for certain biases, and to calibrate our models we could use data from uh, Europe even though that's not gold standard but that's sort of the best we could we could we could use. Okay, so then um, in terms of methodology, we we knew from the outset that um, especially you know ten years ago, twelve years ago. Um, people who used, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, email or sort of, so were probably more likely to be um, young, educated, and therefore also more, uh, more mobile. So, sort of, you know, extrapolating from those, so the whole population would almost surely give us an uh, overestimate of um, international um, uh, mobility. Right? And so, to um, to correct for this, we um, well basically came up with an ad hoc uh, correction factor. Okay? So here's. This is the factor, and let me just quickly explain how this sort of sort of so works. What are the elements? So there's one element in this formula that relates to the internet penetration um, for uh, um, disaggregated by gender, age, and um, uh, uh, country. Sort of, I mean, we would be interested in, in in the U.S., but sort of to calibrate, we also looked at sort of uh, data from um, uh, from Europe. And then there's a factor that controls how strong the influence of this uh, correction factor um, uh, should be. Um, I mean, the details don't matter sort of too much, but what you will probably observe is that if the internet penetration, so if this value of P becomes one, right, sort of, so if everybody is on the internet or on Yahoo, I should say, so think of this as like sort of Yahoo penetration, then, you know, we have, we have full knowledge and the correction factor becomes um, a one. However, if, the, um, if this value of P is smaller than one, then the correction factor becomes also smaller than one, um, which means we're sort of down weighting um, observations from particular uh, user. And, and the best value for K is sort of assumed on data from um, Europe. Okay, so then what do you get from this sort of data? You get something that looks um, like this. So this is now emigration rates so from the US to other countries. This is aggregated by, um, uh, by gender uh, and by, um, uh, by age. Right? And so here in, um, in gray on top, you have the raw estimates without the correction. And then sort of the red or blue bars um, um, sort of lines below are what you get when you uh, correct for this. Right? And so you see that in particular for older ages, this correction makes a big difference. Like without this correction, you would largely, largely overestimate the out migration for older people, because especially for them, the sort of internet penetration is 
um, a smaller and you're sampling from a more, a more, more mobile um, uh, sort of um, a population. Um, so that was Yahoo, but now I'm, I don't, no longer work at Yahoo and no longer have access to this uh, data. So since then we've explored sort of other uh, data sources to understand sort of what's going on um, at the moment. And one such very promising data set comes from uh, Facebook, but not, uh, you know, the, the sort of your direct sort of Facebook profile, but in particular sort of Facebook for business or Facebook um, ads. So um, um, with this data, you know, we're interested in, can we answer something like, you know, how many Venezuelans are living in Colombia? You know, like ideally right now or last week or last month, something um, like this. So how, how would Facebook know or how could we obtain such data through Facebook? So let me try to um, explain um, this. So, so what you see here is a, um, is a screenshot of a publicly accessible um, uh, platform. Again, you have access to the thing that I'm showing you uh, right now. If, you know, after this talk, you just search for ads on um, Facebook. And so here, um, I'm about to launch an advertising campaign targeting people living in in this case, it's north of the Santander, which is part of Colombia. So this is sort of one of the states of Colombia that's on the border with Venezuela. So Venezuela is here on the right, the country of Colombia is on the left. Um, and I'm targeting uh, Facebook users who live in Venezuela. Okay, so Facebook tries to infer uh, your sort of country of, um, of origin, or countries you, you previously um, lived in. And then Facebook tells me how many people match these targeting criteria. Right. So according to Facebook, at the time when I did this query, there were 98,000 Facebook users um, living in this part of Colombia, but who previously lived in um, um, uh, Venezuela. Right. And so now the question is, this, is this data good or sort of, or sort of, sorry, there's a lot of noise and maybe fake profiles and all these um, that kind of um, things. So let's do some sort of, uh, uh, there's a, if you could just mute your mic, so I think there was just uh, some, echo, oh, sorry. Um, Right, so, 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 so we started validating this data first in the context of the um, uh, US. And so what you're looking at here is every, every data point is a combination of country of origin and a host state in the US. For example, this data point here means somebody um, who was born in Mexico or comes from Mexico, with sort, of, uh, sort of different definitions, but lives in California. Okay. Now there are sort of two axes. Okay, so on the y axis, you have um, the um, uh, 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 fraction of foreign born in the American Community Survey according to uh, in 2014. Right? So they have a definition of foreign born, right? And so in, uh, in the, according to this official statistics, um, about 14% or sort of or so of the um, uh, population in Mexico was, uh, sorry, of the population in California was born in Mexico. If you look at Facebook, about 10% of Facebook users living in Mexico in 2000, sorry, living in California, so increasing living in California in 2017, um, lived in Mexico according to, um, to Facebook, right? And so um, this is the area where Facebook underestimates, right? So, so here, official statistics give a higher um, um, uh, estimate than um, you know, Facebook, and this is the, the sort of uh, area where Facebook overestimates, um, right? But you see that even without sort of correcting for any sort of biases, it's not too bad, right? You get us something that's actually somewhat sort of plausible. That's mostly um, uh, sort of close to this um, identity line for a number of different countries of origin and different host um, uh, uh, states. So this is just within the US. Let's have a quick look internationally. So um, here is a different picture, but sort of similar um, uh, meaning. So here now every every data point is a country. So this data point here, I believe, is uh, is Qatar. And um, then on the y-axis, you again you have a measure of uh, the percentage of the population that is foreign born according in this case it's uh, from the world bank it's, it's, it's a log scale but still higher means higher so it's similar to what you saw before and on the x-axis um, again you have sort of an estimate of the percentage of facebook users who are currently sort of living um, um, abroad now in this case this is the identity line and so here's sort of similar sort of um, a picture um, uh, so, so, so uh, you know facebook would underestimate for some countries and overestimate for others but there's some sort of pattern um, in this, right? So if you look at just countries in this color, so this is uh, red, sort of also, which is from Africa, for those, Facebook is most likely to overestimate, right? sort of also, meaning that if you are a migrant moving to an African country, you're probably more likely than the host population to be on Facebook, right? And that makes some sense, right? Whereas in sort of Europe, this bias is not as strong, right? sort of where both the migrants and the host population are more or less equal. Um, uh, sort of equally sampled on um, uh, um, uh, on Facebook, right? And so this is already somewhat reassuring that there's some sort of pattern in this, right? That the bias doesn't seem to be um, uh, a random. Just going back to the US data to really drill down on the bias and trying to understand um, uh, uh, this. So so here, um, so okay, so on the left, we have data for men. On the right, we have data for women. But let's just start with one 
panel here. So here we're looking at data from Mexican men in California. And so if we pick one particular age group, let's say 40 to 44, then according to official data from the American Community Survey, about 20% of men living in California were born in Mexico. But according to Facebook, only about 12 or 13% of men in this age group lived in Mexico. Right? This is born in Mexico, lived uh, uh, um, uh, in Mexico. Right? And if you compare this uh, sort of to, to the sort of pattern of women in California, it's somewhat similar. If you compare this to the pattern of men in Texas and women in Texas, it's also somewhat similar. Right? In all cases, for older people, migrants are um, more undersampled or underrepresented on Facebook. But for the youngest, uh, this is not the case. And for the very youngest, Facebook even gives an overestimate, right? So it's also interesting sort of right? in question in terms of quality of the ground, um, uh, a truth for, uh, for some of this. But again, the key point is this is somewhat systematic, so we can hopefully model it. So this is what we sort of tried to do here, right? So, so here we now try to build a simple sort of regression model that tries to predict the, the, the official statistics using mostly data from Facebook. So, so here we are sort of trying to predict how many people from a particular country of origin are living in a particular country of uh, residents of a particular age gender sort of group using you know the data from Facebook but then we correct for certain biases so we correct for certain biases where we know maybe we are overestimating Mexicans and underestimating Germans or something like this and maybe we are you sort of you know underestimating uh, um, you know older people and overestimating um, and sort of uh, younger people using um, uh, Facebook um, uh, data. And if you do this, this uh, you know, sort of so um, it works reasonably well. Sort of so you, you get an out of sample um, uh, percentage error of sort of thirty seven um, percent with a very very simple model. You know that doesn't even use whatever GDP or language or sort of internet um, penetration. And so that's somewhat sort of uh, reassuring that you can hopefully uh, you know once you understand the biases, you can sort of correct for them um, at least to a large um, um, degree. Okay, so now what can we do with this sort of data operationally? Um, let's talk okay, so what about the Venezuelans. So let me now turn to some work that we did more recently, uh, actually looking at uh, the Venezuelan um, um, uh, exodus. And so, so here, um, uh, okay, let me let me <laughs> try to walk you through this. Uh, so let's for now let's look at only data from uh, uh, this red data. So this is about the host country Colombia. So everything is about Venezuelans or Venezuela as an origin country, but red is for host country Colombia. Here. In this sort of uh, a plot in the bottom, the, the lower line is just the raw number that I showed you before, red of Facebook. Right? So according to Facebook, in June 2018, about 1 million Facebook users who were living in Colombia at the time previously lived in Venezuela. Okay? That's just the raw number. Okay? That's probably an underestimate because not everybody is on Facebook. So we try to correct for this by this, uh, through this upper uh, estimate, where we assume, and this is an assumption, that the Facebook penetration of Venezuelans in Colombia is the same Facebook penetration as among Colombians in Colombia. So the Facebook penetration among Colombians in Colombia, we can estimate sort of, sort of, sort of because we have a pretty good sense of what's the you know, total population and what's the number of Facebook users in, in Colombia. But the Facebook penetration among Venezuelan migrants is harder to estimate, right? Because we don't know the sort of the true number. And so, so we don't know how that sort of relates. So here we're making this um, um, uh, assumption. So under this assumption, this is sort of a sort of a, so um, the, the the true value correcting for the uh, under uh, sort of sampling, right? And similarly here in gray, you have the same thing, but just estimated uh, uh, sort of thumped, uh, uh, across all cities in uh, Latin America. And for reference purposes, here are official uh, estimates from different uh, UN um, reports, right? And sort of a, so 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 they they are strictly compared to, sort of to, to the gray. Right, and it's somewhat similar, but probably the Facebook estimates are larger than the um, UN estimates, which again is at least plausible, sort of to say the um, the, um, the very least. What does this look like subnationally? Again, this is uh, something that we can easily do with uh, with uh, with Facebook data. So here we are comparing data from the Colombian government about the distribution of Venezuelan migrants on the left with data from Facebook about you know where people who used to live in uh, Venezuela are living um, at the moment in the country of June 2018. And you see some sort of similarities, but also differences sort of. So, so both have you know sort of high estimates on the border, in particular on North and Santander, as I mentioned before. But according to Facebook, there are also a larger number of Facebook users further inland. And so now it's a question, you know, who's who's wrong, who's right, right? Because we were actually working with people in Colombia, they actually came back to us and said, okay, you know what, 
this estimate on the right actually looks more plausible than the official um, uh, government uh, uh, data because uh, this was based on self-registration um, and the, the sort of self-registration efforts were more pronounced on the border. So it's very plausible that people further inland are sort of less likely to self-register. Uh, right? But again, it makes this validation, of course, hard because in the end, we don't have good ground truth, which is why we do this in the first place, which makes the validation um, 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 harder. Uh, similarly, we can have estimates for sort of some other um, uh, national estimates for other um, uh, countries. Um, beyond just the estimates of numbers, we can also try to understand their socioeconomic situation. So for this, we, we look at the operating system they use, so whether they use uh, iOS devices or Android devices. And using this, we first train a model that predicts the GDP or GDP per capita of a country and then we apply this model using just the percentage of iOS devices used just to the Venezuelan population. Right? So, so basically, so you know, sort of given that X percent of Facebook users use an iOS device, you know, what's the um, expected GPT of um, uh, that, that I would uh, per capita that I would um, uh, expect? So based on this, we can come up with an estimate of you know, sort of equivalent income um, uh, in a sense. And the precise dollar values are, you know, probably noisy, but what is sort of very robust in all of our experiments are these sort of three groups in the sense, sort of, so that we're quite comfortable sort of saying that probably people from Venezuela who made it only to Roraima in Brazil, which is, you know, basically the jungle that you get to by walking, are worse off than people from Venezuela who made it all the way to the United States. Right? And that's, that's kind of obvious, but then also there are sort of others, you know, we also and uh, comes, comes with sort of saying that probably people who made it to Chile are better off than people who made it only to, um, to Ecuador. And one caveat to point out with these sort of data sources um, uh, also relates to the fact that Facebook can sometimes change its algorithm. So here, the snapshot from a portal that we put together uh, sort of to share with our partners or sort of a sort of a so, um, where you sort of see at some point the estimate of, uh, you know, migrants from, I believe in this case, it's uh, sort of two, in this case, Brazil, suddenly dropped. And this sudden drop is not due to like return migration or something or so, or so, but it turns out it's just that Facebook changes definition. We, we know this because we have like an ongoing collection across all the world. So it was not just this count, like all the counts globally suddenly jumped down. Right, sort of, so. And then a year later, they jumped back up. Sort of, right? But of course that makes it very difficult for some of these sort of long running collections. And you really need to be aware of this and sort of and try to find new ways to and uh, correct uh, for this. But again, we're happy that, uh, you know, despite the limitations, it actually had operational uh, impact through an NGO called uh, IMAP, which is also supported with US by uh, USAID. And um, uh, yeah, last thing on Facebook data very quickly is sort of, sort of, sort of is in trying to combine these different data uh, sources. And this is joint work um, with uh, Francesco um, Rampazzo who's doing this as part of, or has just done this as part of his PhD that he just finished. I believe it's also on this, um, uh, uh, on this call, right? And so here the, the basic idea is that, okay, we give up on any kind of gold standard data. We, we're not trying to, you know, take this as a, as, a, as a goal, as a reference and sort of try to recreate this. Rather, we, we know that all, all data have their sort of biases and limitations. Um, and we sort of make those explicit, right? We explicitly code what, what we believe the limitations sort of also, um, uh, are. Um, and then we sort of try to find the true but unknown estimates that are most consistent with what we observe under these uh, assumptions. Right? So this is like a Bayesian um, uh, approach, right? And if, you, if you apply this to data for the UK, and if you look at just data from Poland, this is actually interesting, right? So, so that this model in green comes up with larger estimates and the official data in yellow, right? Sort of, so, and then this, in a sense, you know, probably the green data is better, right? Because the UK acknowledges that the data in yellow is actually an undercount, right? Sort of, so, so this model might actually be sort of closer to the truth than uh, the official um, um, uh, uh, data. Uh, uh, okay, uh, so, so, uh, last data source on, on sort of this no casting relates to uh, satellite um, uh, imagery, right? Sort of, so, so can we actually, find traces of migration um, that are visible from, uh, from space. And here we are mostly looking at this sort of Syrian uh, uh, context right, where a lot of people have fled and we're interested sort of, can we actually see this? And here, um, first you should ask, do actually people flee by vehicle? And fort fortunately, sort of in, 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 in Florida, it turns out that uh, in the Syrian context, most people really, you know, leave by vehicle, right? This is not the case in other, um, uh, sort of uh, scenarios. For example, in uh, Venezuela and uh, between Venezuela and Colombia, you have these 
caminantes, right? So sort of many people literally leave by walking, right? But at least in Syria, most people leave by vehicle. So the question is, can we find vehicles and can we uh, in satellite imagery and is as a proxy for um, uh, for a displacement, right? So here I'm showing this uh, satellite image from uh, Al Bab, where was a lot of uh, quite a bit of fighting. And right? before the fighting happens, like you see, sort of cars here and here and here and here. And then during the fighting, you know, you don't see any cars. All the cars are gone. And then after the fighting, I mean, this is just cloud cover. It's not not some explosion or something or sort of. A, so you see a lot of cars that have um, returned, right? And so so we try to sort of automatically detect these um, uh, cars and sort of count them. And indeed, we sort of see sort of patterns that uh, you know seem to reflect um, um, sort of a sort of a, so people you know leaving the area and sort of returning uh, to the uh, area, right? And so now. Um, there's a lot of things we have to sort of sort out different types of biases in the data, like time of the day might matter, day of the week might matter. Um, and we still have to uh, build an actual model for displacement on top of this, right? So not just counting cars, but trying to translate this to actual number of people who have left the area. But this is something that I'm quite excited about. I think it's very, um, very promising. And the last thing uh, on this is you know, sort of predicting um, the future. So this is all about, you know, what's, what's going on in the present or maybe in the past, if we have historic data, but can we actually predict um, um, uh, migration. Right? And here people, uh, you know, typically turn to Google Trends um, uh, um, uh, data. Right? You know, basically, are people searching on Google for a better um, life? And uh, others that we're also collaborating uh, with us sort of have said yes. I mean, no one said yes, so they found that uh, at the international level, there is, um, uh, you know, you can actually uh, build a model that um, you know, sort of uses the sort of searches on Google to sort of predict how many people will migrate to another country in six months or maybe in a year or sort of so. Right? Um, so here, just to show you an example, right? So, so the type of query you might be interested in is in the United Kingdom, how many people are searching for jobs in Germany over time? But maybe there are periods where they are searching more and periods where they're searching less. Maybe they are sort of somehow predictive of how many people will actually pack up and um, um, uh, leave. And so this is a project that we are currently doing with a, a Bertelsmann a Foundation in the European context um, uh, only, where we are only looking at Germany as a destination country, only migration to Germany, and only from EU and EFTA um, countries. So very, very limited, I mean, very, well, somewhat limited in, uh, in scope, but, but that helps us because it sort of gives a more controlled setup, right? Within the um, EU, you can you have free, uh, you know, free movement or something, so you don't have to worry about visa and all these kind of things. Um, and, and so it's more sort of controlled um, uh, uh, setup. Um, we started also by doing an online uh, survey um, to sort of understand you know, how far in advance people would actually um, start searching on Google and if they were actually uh, uh, searching on Google. Because also, also in many countries, maybe Google or people don't necessarily turn to um, uh, Google, which is still something we have to uh, uh, deal with. Um, there's a lot of additional data that um, we want to use in this. So, so this, as a ground truth, you know, we will use uh, the number of actual EU nationals who register in Germany in the end. Um, you know, the data on Gallup uh, from Gallup World Poll on uh, how many people um, uh, have the intention to emigrate, uh, data on uh, employment, and also data from the Goethe Institute on maybe German language courses that might turn out to be um, uh, um, uh, predictive. Um, but all of this is still uh, ongoing work. So at the moment, uh, uh, for example, we, the, for small countries, um, there's a lot of sort of sparse data that we are trying to um, address at the moment. So of course, we don't have results uh, yet, but just to show you, this is certainly something that we are very uh, interested in um, as well. Okay, the so last, last thing I want to talk about is uh, the importance of uh, goats, okay, so, or the, uh, rather the importance of um, uh, context. So, so I first came across this um, uh, by uh, UNHCR. So UNHCR, um, so the Refugee Agency, I'm sure you're familiar with them, uh, they have a project called Project Jetson, right? This is also about predicting how many people will leave a particular location. And I came across this in the context of um, uh, migration or refugee movement from Somalia, which is sort of here, to Ethiopia, right? or more specifically from Somalia into these refugee camps um, uh, uh, on the border, sort of. So, and especially, so like up to sort of 2018, um, there were quite a number of people hosted in these refugee camps, right? so, so exceeding 200,000 people. And so you and I just wanted to know, okay, how many more people are coming? Or when are they coming? Um, and all these kind of things. And so, so in an effort sort of to build a, a prediction model, they actually send people uh, in a sort of, so to the refugee camps and sort of to Somalia to understand their um, um, local context. And in this context, they came across the importance of Somali goats. And so um, uh, basically sort of like before getting ready to move, um, 
people would ha uh, sort of have to leave, uh, sorry, have to sell their um, goats. So it turns out that sort of goats are not made for this sort of long journey. So they would sort of cash in, um, you know, all their livestock um, and sort of convert it to, um, um, to money, right? And so based on this, I actually observed that, ah, that's interesting observation, right? So just by the sort of uh, law of supply and demand, that probably means that uh, a, a drop in the prices for goats or like a, an increase in supply rather should you know, lead to a drop in prices of goats and basically indicate that people have sort of packed up and are ready um, to leave. And that actually turned out to be true. So it turned out to be a very good predictor in their model turned out to be the, the price of goats. It was not, nothing that I ever would have thought of, you know, from a thousand kilometers um, away, not knowing anything at all about the local context or, you know, cultures or sort of uh, anything of this. And so the person behind this, her name is uh, um, Rebecca Moreno Jimenez, sort of puts it very sort of um, uh, nice. So I'll just read this from um, an article or sort of so she was quoted in. So it's all about a uh, context. Silicon Valley, or you could substitute people like myself, right? Like data scientists are far away from the reality and the ethical problems data present in an unequal world. Right? So trying to explain the complexity of this world with a few models in some data sets is too limited in the humanitarian sector, right? So the humanitarian sector is about humans and sometimes irrational and rational human choices, right? And so these sort of contact or the choices, of course, we don't see in the data, right? I mean, I've, I've never been to a refugee camp. I, I don't know anything about the local context, right? So this also really shows you the limits of what you can do, uh, you know, with big data from a thousand miles um, uh, um, 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 away. Uh, just one side of information, if you're interested in this broader sort of area, um, also check out the big data for Migration um, um, Alliance. And um, yeah, I would like to uh, thank thank you for, for listening and happy to take any questions. Here are some suggestions that you might want to ask about. Yes, thank you, Ingmar, for the interesting talk. Uh, a lot of uh, good, interesting, also uh, potential future directions um, were in there where we need to have a look at, definitely. Um, so the floor is open for questions. Um, you can type your question into the chat, then I can uh, read the question and ask Inma, uh, but also you can raise your hand if you like. Um, and while you are thinking uh, about the question, I, can, I have one. Um, you talked a lot about biases. I think this is a huge, huge problem. And you talked about, uh, I think, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, but there are uh, so many other sources. Uh, can you uh, maybe tell a bit more um, how can you deal with the different biases in, in, each, uh, in each source? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the bias is, is, is a very, very important question, sort of, or so, and is also an important limitation, sort of, or so. And so there are different ways to, to deal with this. So in the best case, you have sort of gold standard data for some locations that you can learn from to extrapolate to locations where you don't have that, right? So basically, you would sort of learn like a mapping, okay, here's this bias data, something that maps to this gold truth, like this sort of data. And then this mapping you apply in another context where the gold sort of truth or the you know, ground truth is sort of missing. Sort of. So, so that, that's, that's the best sort of setting, right, sort of supervised machine learning when there is um, data to, to, to sort of calibrate um, uh, against. Unfortunately, often, you know, that you don't, you're not in that setting, sort of. So often you don't have anything to calibrate against, right? You just have only this biased sort of data, right? And so then, then what you can, what, what, what can you still do? So then one, uh, one thing you can often still do is sort of to give up on absolute estimates, but focus on relative estimates, right? Just is it sort of going up or down, or is it more in, in this on this, right? So, so if you, you, know, you no longer try to estimate the absolute value of a function, but just the derivative, right? And, and, and you can even formalize that sort of under certain assumptions about the structure of the bias, the, the, the estimates of the derivative will still be unbiased, sort of, sort of, sort of, depends on how, how exactly the, sort of the bias, you know, sort of, um, um, uh, uh, enters a sort of a sort, right? and, and so that can sort of sometimes still work, right? You say, okay, well, it, I don't know what the true value is, is, but it seems to have gone up a lot over the last two months, or it has gone down, or it's you know much more in the north than it is um, uh, in the south, right? But but then there's a, so this is still sort of a, this is works okayish sort of a, sort of a, but then the 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 biggest or, or the the last sort of category is then now is if this bias is somehow uneven sort of so right so if, if now um you know the maybe the the it, it's changing across time or the the bias in the north and the south is very different in ways you don't understand or sort of so right uh, or 
um, for example, maybe um, uh, you know your um, you know it, it differs uh, uh, between rich and poor, and and maybe you know, most late, lately only poor people have come and they don't have internet connectivity, and they're sort of missing in your data, right? So they, they give you like a you know, sort of you don't have any any digital footprints of those. And those are things you know that I'm most worried about, sort of. So, so those are the biases, you know, that you can sort of, sort of like the the you know the the unknowns, unknowns, or I don't know what you would call them, sort of. So like sort of. So that, that sort of is very difficult to, um, to uh, to guard against, right? And, and then the the best the best thing you can do there is really to um, rely on sort of data triangulation, sort of. So, so at least at least in those, I mean, at least fortunately, I would say in those settings where data quality is. The biggest challenge, let's say, in the humanitarian sort of setting, like uh, some humanitarian crisis, at least in my experience, the the actors there are used to dealing with messy data, missing data, not you know untrustworthy sort of data, right? So they would never, they would never take the answer that you give them. Okay, this is now the one ground truth, and I forget everything else, right? So they then sort of do some triangulation: is this even plausible? Does it fit with what we hear from the ground? You know, sort of, or sort of, or so, and then they would. Um, work with us to sort of somehow have their own mental model for debiasing this in ways that, you know, I, I, I could not do explicitly. That's good. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Don't have the blind trust uh, because it's, I mean, it's, it doesn't matter. As soon as you deal with data, you have biases and you need mm. to check uh, critically. Um, yeah, so Jan, you had a question. Yes, uh, thanks, Ingmar. I have a. I was intrigued by your story about goats, um, and uh, it reminded me of a discussion that we often have among economists um, uh, uh, about when causal analysis um, becomes data mining. Uh, and of course, if you look at that relationship and and think about it naively, you could argue, well, uh, the, the price of goats predicts migration. But actually, of course, the migration decision was made, and then the goats are sold, and then the people move. Mm -hmm. So. So it's not really a causal relationship, um, but um, there is a causal relationship involved and all that. So is that an issue for, for you when you when you work with this? Or, or is it um, more about finding the variables that best predict an outcome? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and how do you deal with that? Or may, maybe you have come across that discussion with economists already. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's a good question. So um, mo I mean, um, most of my work does so far not look at any causal claims. So, so it's, it's, it's very much just about, okay, here's a, there's missing data, right? There's like some value we try to impute, right? We don't know the number of aliens in Colombia. Um, can you, what's that number, right? Just guess that number and you can use any correlations, whatever sort of, so just please fill this number um, in this sort of table um, uh, uh, for me, right? So, so as such, most models we use are purely correlational, right? They, they just, Happen, you know, sort of uh, to work, right? Um, and and that is okay, at least especially over like let's say a short time period where maybe the causal structures are sort of somewhat constant that they don't sort of change. But of course, it also means that um, you know I, I I wouldn't trust any of my own model, you know, three years from now, four years from now, or maybe even sort of two years from now, right? Because maybe the, the underlying sort of structures of how these things sort of predict is is, is likely changing sort of or so, right? So so it's not that these more, you know, you you could. That you, you don't, you know, you don't necessarily derive new insights into the drivers of migration. I mean, maybe in other models, but not not in most of the work that that that, 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 that I do. It's 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 more of an operational nature. Hey, you know, Ingmar, I need this next week or you know a month from now. And what happens next year? Who cares? Sort of a side, sort of a side. And and, and so in, in that setting, I think there's still um, um, uh, um, uh, value. So if if it's more sort of causal sort of so again there are a lot of other things right you you, you might go back to um satellite imagery for predicting crop yield and like bad harvest sort of so like maybe it starts with a bad harvest that then leads to maybe even a civil war in syria as some people claim right that then leads to sort of something else sort of so right so so it's you know it, it might start well well before and maybe other data are better suited than um you know for the sort of causal analysis and um the sort of digital traces Okay, thank you. Yeah, interesting. I think this is also, uh, I figured out one major research direction at the moment, uh, go beyond the correlation and find uh, also causal mm. uh, relationship in data. Um, yeah. Um, there, there's a, a question in the chat from Brian Okango, and he says, great. Have you done any migrant research in Africa? And was there a comparison with national data and big data? 
yeah, we, we haven't done any um, any in-depth uh, uh, analysis. So if you, um, I mean, we have looked at let's say at least feasibility of using uh, a Facebook data in that particular sort of setting, or sort of a sort of a sort of you know sort of a, so is it even um, uh, uh, covered? And uh, and it's a bit uh, mixed. So first, Facebook doesn't support all countries of origin, uh, I mean, neither globally nor in the African context. So you know it supports. Let's say I don't remember all of them. Like when they say Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, you know, Northern Africa, I think South Africa, uh, Kenya, and, and and a few others. But there are a lot of countries that would not be supported as a country of origin, at least on on, on Facebook in particular, sort of sort of right. Um, then um, uh, you know when it comes to sort of Facebook penetration in the different countries, it also varies a lot, sort of. So I think in Kenya it's 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 sort of you know uh, um, uh, sort of um, uh, um, higher, but like in, in Malawi, for example, there was I think almost no footprint or sort of a sort of for this um, uh, type of data, right? It might still work in urban contexts though, sort of so. So if you just look at um, you know sort of capitals or sort of sort of so, there might still be data, but we haven't done any um, you know in depth. Uh, analysis uh, in that context um, uh, yet, um, but the sort of country level shallow analysis we've done, uh, you know, if, if you, um, yeah, maybe I'll drop the link here, or if, if you just look to my, uh, at my homepage for the publications, you'll see an article about uh, Facebook data in Africa, where we sort of look at this, you know, just more in depth, or just what's the Facebook penetration and what's what might be promising to look at in more depth. And this is also joint work with uh, Francesco Rampazzo, who was, uh, uh, I think, I believe on, 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 on the call. Ah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I saw that Francesco also uh, put something in the chat uh, with the link. Um, uh, thanks, thanks. <laughs> There's another question from Yvonne Navila. Uh, she said, good presentation. And the research could be challenging in my country where first borders are porous, uh, second few mm -hmm. have internet facilities, and thirdly, mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. for managing data are not very developed. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know which country you are referring to, but maybe you can um, mm -hmm. say something to, uh, to the problems you pointed out. Yeah. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so so at least the 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 the, the reliance on, um, in particular, say the the, the sort of digital uh, traces or sort of or so, like through Twitter, Facebook, or you know Google, Yahoo, whatever, or sort of or sort of or so, will not work in all contexts, right? I mean, this is this is absolutely the um, uh, so the case depending on you know the, the the particular country or whether it's it's rural or urban, it might be completely pointless to even. Even try this or sort of a sort of a sort. Right? I, I, I'm not saying this is you know the, the cure all. It'll work in all contexts by 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 no means. I think you're absolutely um, uh, uh, right. Um, depending on the context, again, there might be other data sources that might work. Right, like if um, you know migration or displacement happens by vehicle. Again, maybe you can see this in satellite imagery, like sort of so. Or maybe there are these other markers, like in maybe it's prices of goats or something. Who knows or something or sort of a sort of a sort that that that, that, that could be. Um, uh, uh, predictive, right? So, th so there might be other data sources that, you know, might still be interesting to look at. But uh, you know, you know, the, probably the person knows much more about the local context than um, than me, and would have a better sense of what might be promising to um, to look at in the particular um, country. Yeah. I think a, a question related to this is uh, because I uh, I'm dealing with remote sensing data, and it's um, I was. Um, I mean, one reason is that we don't always get data from people which are uh, which are or they are not willing, even if they have the possibility, they are not willing to give us uh, information via surveys. So um, do you see any possibility, for example, in the direction of gamification or i mean this is common uh, in computer vision to get annotated mm. data reference data some to give people something they have fun mm. with and uh, to get data in contrary can you say something about this if mm. uh, you have plans in this direction or if there's something mm. existent um, I mean, the closest thing I can think of are incentivized online surveys, sort of. So, so both we and others have used, uh, in particular, survey, uh, sort of Facebook, to um, actively reach out to migrants, right? So, so I mean, it, it, so, so I mean, in our work, so I mean, in, in the work I've described so far, we never actually launched the actual advertising, but others, and you know, including ourselves, have then gone further and actually launched the advertising. Let's right? so, say, oh, um, you know, hey, uh, you know, we are interested in understanding. The um, you know the the quality of life of Polish people living in the UK. 
um, you know, please take this online survey and maybe for the chance of winning an iPhone or an Amazon voucher mm -hmm. or sort of something or sort of or so, right? And, 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 and um, so that gives you, of course, it's, 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 not, a, it's not a formal, um, it's not a representative sample, right? It gives you like a convenient sample, right? It gives you a, a typically a fairly cost-effective way of, of uh, sort of sampling um, uh, a hard to reach population, including migrants, uh, sort of a sort of a sort in a, in a you know, or, or a small, fairly small uh, geography. Um, um, other than that, I, I um, it's, no, I, I have not thought about, um, yeah, sort of gamification and other sort of, uh, in, yeah, incentives beyond, again, just offering some kind mm -hmm. of, you know, raffle reward through sort of online surveys or so yeah jan you raised your hand again sorry i thought you forgot to put oh, it on. yeah well i i am um, unraised and raised it again so all fine <laughs> um i was just wondering there might be a few people in the chat uh here um who are now thinking about uh how to do this kind of work and um for some of the data sources uh, sources you use it seemed to me that you, you need to know how to get them so uh, is there any advice that you can give on, on how, to, how to get, I mean, are these all publicly available data or does it sometimes depend on, on your network mm. or uh, certain channels mm. you use? So maybe you can give a bit of advice of, of how, how you could get, start doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, good, good, good question. So, so, um, so the, the Facebook data is probably the easiest to uh, access sort of also. So there's a well-documented, so-called uh, API, like application programming interface, where you can very easily collect, um, you can easily write a program. I mean, all of this requires a program. I mean, okay, let me rephrase this. So if you just need two, three numbers, you can get those through this Facebook interface that I just showed you. You can just, you know, after this talk, search for ads on Facebook and with a couple of clicks, you know, you get these estimates and you can write down like a dozen by hand or sort of. So, so, so that's, that's the easiest, easiest, not even technical knowledge is required. You know, sort of a sort of a so you can you can do if you if you need more than a dozen estimates sort of a so right then um you can you can get a lot more by writing a simple program to um uh, to collect this or sort of a so. so facebook is the easiest to collect twitter is probably the second well it's, it's, it's more like one tier lower but still fairly easy to collect they also have a um, an api they also work with uh, researchers or sort of a so to collect this data there the biggest hurdle is that you will need to collect micro level data i mean like you know individual users and then there's sort of the histories which just means you have to make a lot more requests to get sort of data that you can ultimately derive migration estimates from sort of so so it's not it's not so much the what but just the amount of data you have to collect is quite a bit higher which makes it just harder sort of or so um google trends is also fairly easy to collect i mean they um uh you know there, there's there's an official api for google trends but there's also even without the official api it's not too difficult to automate this or sort of also so this also frequently used but then there are also other data sources where you have to rely like on a on a buddy or something or sort of so, like for example that and, and and one or not or not a buddy or is a, a whole infrastructure to be set up so for example we've done some work on mobile phone data that i didn't um uh, uh, talk about sort of so right? and, and to have access to uh, mobile phone data because it's very very sensitive of course you you must have somebody at a you know a telco operator um you know who's willing to go through the trouble of de-aggregating and de-anonymizing and sort of and somehow providing um uh you know um as was fortunately um you know uh, uh, organizations such as uh, uh, flowminder um uh, and data pop alliance and and sort of others they, they've sort of done this work before that you know their workflows for those uh, data um, and in other cases, it just depends on whether you can afford to pay. So, for example, for the satellite imagery, if, especially if you want uh, historic archives, you know, you you can access it basically as long as you you can afford it. Sort of a sort of a, so, so there are companies that just sell this data, um, and um, uh, you know that, that are willing to sort of to uh, um, to provide this. So so yeah. So so so, so again, so, some data you can only access. Doesn't matter if you have money or not. You must have somebody on the inside. Some data you just need to pay, and others are easier to access. You know, for 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 anybody. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. That's true. <laughs> um, other further questions? Um, otherwise, I would say Jan, I give the word back to you if there are no comments. No, I don't see anything. Yeah. 
Okay, well, I don't make many words. I just like to thank everyone uh, for listening in and especially, of course, our speaker uh, for the for the great overview. I, I think I learned a lot and I now have to sort my ideas on on what to do with this. Um, and uh, if, if you are, and that will be, um, of course, our hope, if you are available for, for collaborations on one or the other questions, um, it would be great if we could uh, keep uh, in touch and um, exchange ideas uh, whenever possible. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we will let you know when, once this is uploaded. Uh, and uh, well, thanks everyone once again, and see you in our next lecture. Yeah, thanks again. Also, others on, on the call, feel free to reach out to me if you need pointers to, you know, whatever code snippets or whatever, I'd be happy to help you get started with this type of data. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks very much, Ingmar. No, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>